in the mid-1990s, EMD still looked untouchable. Their DC-powered freight locomotives dominated every major railroad, and the SD40-2 had become the most trusted machine in North America. GE was supposed to be the runner-up, improving each generation, but never quite dethroning the king. Then GE introduced something EMD wasn't prepared for. The AC4400 CW didn't just outperform EMD's best units. It exposed a weakness EMD couldn't fix, forcing the company into failures and desperate decisions that still follow them today. This is the locomotive that didn't just beat EMD in the 90s. It still haunts them three decades later. Before the AC4400 entered the picture, EMD still controlled North American freight railroading with a level of dominance GE had spent decades trying to crack. The SD40-2 remained the backbone of multiple Class 1 fleets, yeah, built in huge numbers and supported by a maintenance culture that understood every relay, module card, and test point in EMD's DC system. Crews trusted the 645 engine, Shops trusted the D77 traction motors, and railroads had a deep investment in parts, training, and experience that kept EMD firmly in front. But the foundation had begun to shift earlier than most rail fans remember. GE had already taken meaningful market share in the 1980s with the Dash 7 and Dash 8 series. Driven by better fuel economy from the 7 FDL engine and growing confidence in GE microprocessor controls. At the same time, EMD stumbled with the SD50 program. The 645F engine ran harder than mechanics liked, electronics were more fragile than older designs, and the model never earned the reputation the SD40-2 had. That stumble weakened EMD's position heading into the 1990s. EMD also reached the AC traction milestone first, not GE, Burlington Northern received the experimental SD60 Mac units in 1991 and 1992, and those tests proved that radial trucks and AC induction motors could transform adhesion. Those early units were not large-scale production, but they showed that EMD understood the value of AC before GE publicly committed to it. By 1994, BN had already placed a major order for what would become the SD70 Mac, and that order grew into more than 400 units. These locomotives created the first real AC traction fleet in North America. The gap between EMD and GE came from the speed of execution. GE was already preparing a full production AC locomotive while publicly downplaying AC's usefulness and they paired their new AC traction package with the proven Dash 9 platform. EMD, meanwhile, spent years reacting to fuel economy pressure and emissions targets. They developed the 265H engine and the SD90 Mac program instead of refining the 710 engine and scaling AC production as fast as the market demanded. GE brought a complete, reliable AC package to Class 1 railroads years earlier than EMD could match at high volume. Railroads saw the difference immediately. AC traction delivered better adhesion on heavy haul trains, especially coal. AC motors also avoided the violent overspeed events that DC motors suffered when slip controls failed. Slipping was not impossible on AC units, but induction motor physics reduced torque as wheels spun, which made AC far easier on crews and far less damaging to equipment. EMD could match this performance on the SD70 Mac, but GE's single inverter per axle architecture gave them finer control and simpler diagnostics. Mechanics complained about early GE fault logs, but GE had the full production system that railroads wanted. All of this created the perfect setup for the AC4400 to hit EMD where it hurt. EMD still appeared dominant on paper, but their real advantage was sliding. GE had closed the efficiency gap, matched their reliability, mastered microprocessor control, and arrived with a scalable AC traction system while EMD was still stretching resources across too many programs. That combination exposed a weakness inside EMD that the company could not fix fast enough, and the consequences of that weakness have followed them ever since. G 
GE had been chasing EMD for decades, but the early 1990s gave them the opening they needed. While EMD was busy recovering from the SD50's reputation issues and stretching their engineering teams across the SD70 Mac and the high-risk SD90 Mac programs, GE built their next move on top of a stable platform, the Dash 9. The AC4400 wasn't a wild experiment. It was a proven chassis paired with an AC traction system GE had refined aggressively behind the scenes. Even though EMD had reached AC traction first with the SD60 Mac test units on Burlington Northern, GE was the first to scale it into a full production package. Their architecture used one inverter per axle, giving much finer adhesion control than EMD's per truck setup on early AC models. And while GE publicly downplayed AC traction as unnecessary in 1993, they were privately preparing an AC locomotive that would land in the exact market EMD thought it owned. For railroads running heavy haul coal, the difference was immediate. AC traction motors handled low speed, high tonnage service far better than DC motors, since induction motor physics naturally reduced torque during slip events instead of exploding into a runaway overspeed event. Slip wasn't impossible, but it was far more controlled, less violent, and less damaging. The result was better adhesion, less wheel wear, and more usable horsepower on the rail, exactly what coal roads needed. But the AC wasn't perfect and technicians noticed. Early GE diagnostic systems logged faults constantly, burying electricians in pages of non-critical alarms. And the FDL engine wasn't as friendly to in-frame repairs as EMD 710, which meant GE units often spent more time in shops when major work was required. Still, railroads were willing to accept those trade-offs because the adhesion gains were too big to ignore. Where GE1 was scale, they could deliver AC traction and volume quickly and on a platform railroads were already comfortable operating. They had the manufacturing capacity, the aggressive financing, and the finesse that comes from refining a design over multiple generations. EMD had the SD70 Mac, a solid AC locomotive, but GE had momentum. All at the exact moment, EMD was stretched thin. Once railroads committed to GE's AC program, the buying patterns shifted in a way EMD struggled to counter. That shift didn't just change the locomotive market in the moment. It set in motion a long-term imbalance that still shapes EMD's position today. By 1995, the locomotive market didn't just shift, it broke open. For decades, EMD had enjoyed a level of institutional trust that seemed impossible to shake. Their engines were easier to maintain in frame, their DC traction motors were familiar to every shop from Alliance to Cumberland, and their reputation for reliability dated back to the GP and SD fleets that built modern railroading. But beneath that confidence, the ground had already started giving way. GE had spent the 1980s quietly taking market share with the Dash 7 and Dash 8 programs, and mechanics were beginning to appreciate the diagnostic clarity that GE's microprocessor systems offered over EMD's older relay logic. The SD50's reliability problems didn't destroy EMD's credibility, but they left cracks GE was happy to widen. By the early 90s, railroads were also beginning to confront the limitations of their older DC fleets in ways that didn't show up on spreadsheets but mattered on the ground. Heavy tonnage operations were pushing locomotives harder, long mountain grades were exposing the weak points of DC slip control, and the old practice of simply adding more units wasn't sustainable as fuel costs and labor hours climbed. Mechanics were already pulling event logs from early GE microprocessor units that showed more precise control of wheel slip and load regulation than EMD's older relay-driven systems. That didn't mean GE's units were intrinsically more reliable, but railroads were starting to notice which builder had a clearer path forward as trains got heavier and operating margins tightened. When AC traction arrived, those cracks finally split. EMD reached AC first with the SD60 MAC tests, proving that radial trucks and induction motors could redefine adhesion. Burlington Northern's massive SD70 MAC orders in 1992 and 1993 showed that railroads understood the potential. What EMD didn't do was scale that breakthrough. 
Most of their engineering bandwidth was tied up in the ambitious SD90 Mac and 265H program, an attempt to leap ahead to 6,000 horsepower while juggling emissions pressure, horsepower races, and the lingering fallout from the SD50 era. They had AC traction, but not the production volume or focused roadmap that the market demanded. Instead of leaping to a new engine architecture, GE refined the 7FDL engine and paired it with an AC system built around one inverter per axle. That decision gave GE finer adhesion control, smoother low-speed torque, and a system easier to scale across hundreds of units. Even if GE's early AC locomotives flooded electricians with fault logs and were more difficult to service in frame than EMD's 710, the adhesion advantage was too big to ignore. Coal roads could pull longer trains with fewer locomotives, cut helpers, and improve tonnage per crew, tangible savings that showed up in quarterly reports. Once the first AC 4400s hit the Powder River Basin and the Western Mountain grades, the results spread fast. Crews noticed they slipped less violently than DC motors, shops appreciated the consistent adhesion performance, and management saw fewer cut-in requirements and more reliable heavy haul schedules. Union Pacific, CSX, and Canadian carriers began shifting their long-term purchasing toward GE's AC program. Even railroads that preferred EMD's cab ergonomics or the familiarity of the 710 engine started buying ACs because the operational math was undeniable. This is the moment where the industry flipped. Not because GE suddenly built a perfect locomotive, they didn't, but because they delivered a complete AC traction package at scale when EMD couldn't. Railroads plan fleets in decades, not years, and once they committed to GE's AC roadmap, EMD's position weakened dramatically. That shift didn't just cost EMD the 90s, it planted a structural disadvantage that has followed them through multiple ownership changes and still defines their uphill battle in the locomotive market today. Once railroads began standardizing their heavy haul fleets around GE's AC program, EMD's position collapsed faster than the company could respond. Class 1 carriers don't switch fleets lightly. They lock in parts inventories, training programs, and maintenance systems for decades. When those long-term commitments shifted toward GE's AC4400 and the Dash 9 platform, EMD lost the foundation that had sustained its dominance since the 1960s. Even though the SD70 Mac performed well, it couldn't compete with GE's ability to deliver AC power at scale. The internal choices EMD made in the 1990s only deepened the damage. The biggest blow came from the SD90 Mac H and its 265H engine, which railroads quickly realized was nowhere near ready for service. Union Pacific, the largest buyer, sidelined many of their units early because the 265H suffered from chronic mechanical issues, part shortages, and a fragile design that couldn't survive the realities of long-haul freight. Instead of proving EMD could leapfrog GE, the SD90 Mac H became a symbol of overreach. A locomotive railroads didn't trust and couldn't rely on for consistent service. That failure didn't just hurt sales, it damaged EMD's reputation at the exact moment GE was offering a stable, scalable AC platform railroads could commit to for decades. The SD90 Mac and 265H engine absorbed the resources that should have gone into scaling AC production around the proven 710. Instead of strengthening their advantage, EMD chased the 6,000 horsepower race producing a platform that arrived fragile, late, and difficult for railroads to commit to. GE, meanwhile, delivered thousands of AC 4400s and Dash 9s with consistent build quality while rolling out incremental refinements that kept carriers buying. By the time EMD shifted focus back to its core platform, the market had already moved on. Railroads were planning their next 20 years around GE's AC roadmap, and those decisions locked EMD into a permanent second position that no amount of engineering improvement could undo. It remains the defining competitive gap in North American locomotive manufacturing.